with regard to specific food elimination, the pioneering research on this was done in England through the East Anglia group, which is where Cambridge University is, their main teaching hospital, Addenbrooke's Hospital. They had a very good response of their patients to an elemental enteral feeding diet. That is 84% of adults with active Crohn's disease went into remission after two weeks of an elemental diet. It's higher than average. They then randomized these patients to receive either prednisolone, a steroid, or diet only. And the way they handled the dietary component is that patients would introduce foods of their choice one at a time, eliminating foods that provoke symptoms once they had gone into remission. This is a little bit different than people who have active disease who need to avoid food because it aggravates their diarrhea. These are people who are in remission, but when they introduce a new food, finds that it provokes symptoms. So at six months, they had a 70% remission rate in the patients who were on diet only, and these patients were not on maintenance medications. A lot of the drugs that are used today weren't routinely used in the 1980s, whereas it was only 34% for the patients on maintenance steroids. It's been shown that steroids don't really help to maintain remission of Crohn's disease. At two years, there was a 38% of the patients treated with diet only remained in remission versus 21% of the patients who were on steroids. Most patients with Crohn's disease have antibodies directed against baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. In fact, it's part of the diagnostic testing for separating Crohn's from ulcerative colitis. These ASCA positive patients have white blood cells that when exposed to mannan, which is a component of yeast, have an increase in the production of tumor necrosis factor alpha. That's an inflammatory mediator, and it's the target of drugs like Remicade. There was a study done in patients with chronic stable but active Crohn's disease who were put on dietary yeast elimination, and they had an improvement in the Crohn's disease activity index. When they were given baker's yeast, they returned to their baseline level of activity. This is where the genetic studies have gotten interesting. There's a group in New Zealand that um, is doing two things. First of all, the clinical researchers are looking at the impact of diet on the symptoms and disease activity in Crohn's disease, which is that patients with Crohn's disease are often, probably most of the time, sensitive to specific foods, but it's different foods for different individuals. They then teamed up with geneticists who were looking at genes underlying Crohn's disease. They identified a particular gene that was associated with sensitivity to mushrooms and corn. And this is a gene that codes for an enzyme called a sodium-dependent organic cation transporter. It's a GI enzyme. And there's a change in that gene which is called a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP, that increases the risk of Crohn's disease in certain populations. And they basically hypothesize that the pattern of food sensitivities in patients with Crohn's disease may wind up being at least in part genetically determined. Now, the East Anglia researchers introduced this diet called the Loflex diet as a substitute for the enteral feedings. And typically, the diet would consist of chicken, lamb, rice, potato, perhaps soy, or one fruit and one vegetable for a period of two weeks. And it was about as effective as the enteral feedings in inducing remission in their group of patients. Then they would conduct the structured food challenges to construct a maintenance diet. And adherence to this has been associated with a relapse rate of under 10 percent a year back in those days when they first developed it without medication. Now there's a study that was done in Japan for maintenance of remission in patients with Crohn's disease with a diet they called a semi-vegetarian diet. It's quite a bit different. I'm mentioning it now um, because it got a lot of uh, press on the internet, especially on vegetarian websites about a year ago, and was pretty highly misrepresented in that press. These were patients who had already gone into remission, and they were maintained on whatever maintenance medication 
they've been given. Daily staples of brown rice, miso, pickled vegetables, green tea, fruits, vegetables, egg, yogurt, and legumes and potatoes. And the brown rice and miso and pickled vegetables and green tea were eaten three times a day. Meat or fish was allowed twice a month. What was avoided, and I personally think this is the most important part of this diet, were sweets, <coughs> fast food, alcohol, and snack foods. The characteristics of this diet were, this is actually a pretty high fiber diet. So unlike the low flex diet, which is low fiber, this diet provided 32 grams of fiber a day, which is about 50% more than the average American diet. It's a pretty low fat diet, only 18% of calories from fat, which is about half of the average American diet. The protein content is exactly the same as the typical American diet, 16% of calories. So it's not a low protein diet. And it's not even a semi-vegetarian diet because eggs and uh, dairy products are eaten daily and um, fish and meat occasionally. They followed 22 patients for a period of two years, and there were 16 patients that were compliant with the diet. All 16 of those remained in remission at one year, and 15 out of the 16 remained in remission at two years. It's a pretty good rate for maintenance of clinical remission. Whether it was really total remission or not isn't clear, because the C-reactive protein stayed low in, in nine of those 16. There were six patients who said, forget about this, I don't like this diet, and only 33% of them remained in remission at two years. Whether that's a reflection of other aspects of why they didn't want the diet or the diet itself isn't clear. But I, I think what's important about this diet is that for maintenance of remission in patients with Crohn's disease, high fiber diet seems to be fine. And one does not necessarily need to restrict fiber in that setting. One thing I want to say is that the genetics of inflammatory bowel disease in Japan may be different than the genetics of IBD in North America and Europe, and so the responses to diet may be different in different populations. And there is more information on the website of the Foundation for Integrative Medicine, it's mdheal.org and at a website called pilladvice.com, which I created to deal with drug supplement interactions.